When I was a junior in college, a group of friends decided they wanted to go home with me to Salt Lake City for spring break. The big, big draw was our family lived probably 20, 25 minutes from several major ski runs. On the first day on the slopes, my dad decided that we needed to take a shortcut to get back to the lodge for lunch. Being a strictly bunny slope type of skier, I quickly asked, Dad, can I handle this run? Now let me quickly explain to you why I'm a strictly bunny slope type of skier. It's not because I don't know how to ski. I know how to twist and turn my body and go swish, swish with the best of them. But when I see something steeper than a small hill, it does something funny to my brain. My brain completely forgets that it is his responsibility to communicate with the rest of the body what to do when I get going too quickly down a hill. And so, not wanting to embarrass myself or die, my question for my dad was, can I, your only son, the one who has to carry your name into the future, the one that you claim to love, handle this shortcut? Now, you need to know my dad's a good man. But for some reason, when he's skiing and he's hungry, he tends to lie. <laughs> and because I forgot this about him, I soon found myself staring down what appeared to me one of those ski jump type of runs. I turned to my dad and I said, I can't do this. I said, is, is there another way? Do you know what he said to me? He chuckled and he said, you got this. I didn't have this. I knew it. He knew it. The eight-year-old kids who were whizzing by me knew it. We all knew it. And as I sat down on the slope, tears forming in my eyes, thinking, I, I don't know if I'll ever get down this mountain. Do you know what my good college friends did for me? They laughed and they skied off without me. Now, I'm sure you're on pins and needles as to how this story ends, and so are, are you ready? Here it is. I survived. B big surprise, right? It, it was to me as well. I got down, but I didn't get down on my skis. I slid down the majority of that silly mountain on my rear end. It was so humiliating. By the time I got back to the lodge, all of my cheeks were red. It was a horrible <laughs> experience. Have you ever been there? Have you ever been in a place where you needed to get from one place where you were to another place, but not knowing how, if it is even possible? Have you ever been stuck? We all have, right? We know what it is to feel stuck emotionally, financially, physically, relationally, spiritually, and or vocationally. We know what it is to feel like, you know what, I want to move from the place where I am to another place that I want, really want to be. But I don't think that it is even possible to get to that place. That's one of the reasons that the start of a new year is so exciting to so many of us because the start of a new year brings with this this sense of anticipation or renewed optimism that I can actually get unstuck. And so we start a new year by making these, these plans to move forward. We call them New Year's resolutions, right? And it's great because for a period of time, these New Year's resolutions, they propel us into forward momentum for a period of time. Unfortunately, it doesn't last for very long for many of us. Unfortunately, all too often what happens is we get to the end of the year and we realize, you know what, I still have a long way to go before I get to the place that I really want to be. Or for many of us, we realize, you know what, I'm really kind of at the same place I was at the very beginning of the year when I made those New Year's resolutions. I once read that of the billions of people worldwide who make New Year's resolutions, only 12% actually finish them. That's encouraging, right? It's what you came to hear this morning then most likely you're going to fail. You say, what, what's the problem? Is the vision not big enough? Is the uh, goal not specific enough? Is it a poorly defined plan? It may be. But I would argue 
the, the main issue is that we have limiting beliefs that keep us from being able to move forward. Those limiting beliefs in our lives, if we hold on to them, we'll never quite reach our intended destination. Limiting, limiting beliefs are a, a lot like a, a rubber band that if you put it around your waist, you, you could make some progress. You could move forward to a certain point, but eventually you just you stretch it out as far as it goes and it snaps you back into place. And you find yourself coming back to the place where you began once again because of those limiting beliefs in your life. Let me give you an example of this in Scripture. Open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4, we find the writer speaking to his audience, and he's talking to them about the rest, the salvation that is promised or available in Jesus Christ. This rest, however, was something that some in his audience, maybe many in his audience, were in danger of missing out on. Now, why exactly was that? Well, it's because they were on the verge of going back to their former way of life in Judaism. Now, impress, to impress upon his audience what a horrible mistake this would be, the writer points them to their ancestors, the Israelites, as an illustration. The, illustr the Israelites, they were given a, a great vision. Really, it was more than a vision. It was a great promise from God. And what was that promise? The promise of God to the Israelites was this. I'm going to lead you out of the place that you are, out of Egyptian captivity, that place you don't want to be where you feel stuck. I'm going to lead you to a new land. It's going to be a, to a land where people flourish. This is the promise. This is the vision. This is what's in store for you. You're going to move from one place to another. You're going to get unstuck. Unfortunately, a whole generation of Israelites never made it. Now, why not? Did God not keep his promise? Well, of course that's not the case. God is the great promise keeper. Not once, nor will he ever break one of his promises. This group of Israelites didn't make it from Egypt to the promised land for one simple reason. I want you to listen to the words that we read in Hebrews chapter 3, beginning in verse 16. And who was it who rebelled against God, even though they heard his voice? Wasn't it the people Moses led out of Egypt? And who made God angry for 40 years? Wasn't it the people who sinned, whose corpse lay, on, lay in the wilderness? And to whom was God speaking when he took an oath that they would never enter his rest? Wasn't it the people who disobeyed him? So we see that because of their unbelief, they were not able to enter his rest. God's promise of entering his rest still stands, so we ought to tremble with fear that some of you might fail to experience it. For this good news that God has prepared this rest has been announced to us just as it was to them, but it did them no good because they didn't share the faith of those who listened to God. For only we who believe can enter his rest. A whole generation of Israelites missed out on the promised land. Why? For this reason, they did not believe. They didn't believe. Now, obviously, the main point of this text is to remind us that belief, that faith is absolutely essential for us to enter into this rest, this freedom, this salvation, this rest in Christ. But it also reminds us that without belief, we will never move forwardly, fully, or forward fully into all that God has planned for us, all that he desires for us to do, all that he desires for us to become, all that he desires for us to experience. Dan Holland in his book, 70 Seconds, writes that our thoughts become our actions, our actions become our habits, our habits form our character, and our character leads to our destiny. But the place where all of this begins is with our beliefs. What we choose to believe, what we choose not to believe, this is where this whole process starts. And just like the Israelites, our beliefs or lack of will largely determine where we end up, our destiny as individuals and as a church. 
So we're kicking off a new sermon series entitled The Power of Belief Today. For the next few weeks, we're going to examine some key beliefs that are absolutely essential to move us forward as individuals and as a group of believers. And for the most part, this series is going to be taken from the story of Exodus. But this morning, I simply want to remind you very quickly of three truths about belief. The first truth is simply this. What I believe is best seen in what I do. Belief is best seen in what we do. There are a lot of things that I claim to believe. I claim to believe that eating healthy is important. Do I believe that? Well, not enough to start off gorging myself on Lay's potato chips and guzzling Dr. Pepper. I claim to believe that exercise is important. Do I believe that? Not enough to put down the remote and actually go for a walk. Now, does this mean that I don't believe those things are true? That I don't believe eating healthy and exercise is important? Of course not. I'm lazy, but I'm not a buffoon. Of course, I believe those things are very important. What it does indicate is this. My belief about those matters, it's pretty shallow. I tend to believe those things are true, especially for you, but not so much for me, right? In all seriousness, what we believe impacts our actions. Our deep-held beliefs, our deep convictions impact our actions, or at least they should. James impresses this upon us in James chapter 2 and verse 17. In the same way, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, is dead. Take note, James doesn't say is weak. He, he doesn't say it's lacking. He says it is dead. I begin here because much of what I'm going to say in this sermon series you're going to immediately believe it. You're going to immediately agree with it. In fact, I'm going to say things like this. God wants what is best for you. And you're going to say, oh, yeah, yeah, I believe that. I really do. I believe that. Why are we even talking about that this morning? That's obvious. I believe it. Here's why we're talking about it. Because there are a whole lot of people, primarily this person right here, who complain, who uh, uh, says he believes that, but at the same time still hesitates and often refuses to follow God into the unknown. And when we're not willing to take a risk or to do what is hard or to be uncomfortable, it's a pretty indica good indication that God cares for you, God wants what, what's best for you, is more theory than it is belief. And here's the thing about theory. Theory Will, will, will not move us forward. It will not get us unstuck. Only deep belief will. And so the first truth about belief is that belief is best seen in what we do. The second truth is simply this. Belief matters to God. It matters to God. Have you ever stopped to think about why is it that Jesus chose to heal certain people but not others? Was it just random? Was it, was it just luck? Just happened to be at the right place at the right time? Well, obviously, there are moments in which Jesus chose to heal individuals because he's just simply compassionate. But in so many cases, Jesus indicates that the reason he made the decision to stop what he was doing and actually bring healing into the life of another person is because belief was present. He points to that. He indicates that. I want to give you one example this morning. Mark chapter 10, verse 46 through 52. Then they came to Jericho. As Jesus and his disciples together with a large crowd were leaving the city, a blind man, Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said, call him. So they called the blind man. Cheer up, on your feet. He's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked. Let me pause right there for just a second. It's a great question, isn't it? 
If Jesus were to ask you this morning, what do you want me to do for you in 2022, what would you say? Jesus, I want you to give me better health. Jesus, I want you to help me break an addiction. Jesus, I want you to give me a purpose in life. Jesus, heal my marriage. Jesus, help me make a new friend. Jesus, help me to believe. What is it that you most want Jesus to do for you in this new year? Some of us refuse to even think about it because we kind of figure it's better not to get our hopes up than to actually be disappointed. But have you ever stopped to consider that it is bringing our deepest desires to Jesus that actually shows faith? As we'll see in the story of the Exodus, moving forward often begins with a deep desire for something different, for something better. That's where it begins. So this is the first, but it's not the last time that I'm going to say this to you throughout this sermon series. God is interested in what you want. He's interested in what you want. The question is, do you believe it? Perhaps a better question would be this. How can we not believe it when you read a story like the story of Bartimaeus? Let's pick up the story in verse 51. I'll show you why. He says, the blind man said, Rabbi... I want to see. What do you want? I want to see. Man, that's what I want. Go, said Jesus. Your faith, your belief has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. Why did he choose to act? Because he saw within Bar... uh, 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 Sorry, I just went blank on his name. Because he saw in Bartimaeus that he believed that was within the character of God within his ability to meet his deepest, greatest desire in life. That's why he acted. Now, does this mean that Jesus will always say yes to our request if we just have enough belief? No, it doesn't. Sometimes Jesus says no. I don't completely understand it. I definitely can't explain it. But sometimes he says no to those who have deep belief. And I imagine more than a few of us have a story or two that we could share that would confirm that statement this morning. There have been things that you've prayed for, things that you've asked, things that you begged Jesus of to do in your life, and for some reason he said no. And I don't get it. And while we don't know exactly why he says no, and while we do understand sometimes he refuses to say yes, we can be confident of this, that he will always say yes to doing good on our life working for our own good, if we'll continue to turn to him or look to him in faith. Now, on the flip side, when there is an absence of faith, there's also an absence or tends to be an absence of God's work or activity in our life. This is one of the lessons that the people of Jesus' own hometown discovered. This one who was doing amazing things in so many different places, he didn't do a whole lot of work in his own community. Why was that? Was it because Jesus didn't care? Was it because he didn't want to? Was it because he didn't have the power to? Obviously not. The reason he didn't do the work there is because why? Well, we read it in Matthew chapter 13 and verse 57 and 58. Then Jesus told them, A prophet is honored everywhere except in his own hometown and among his own family. And so he did only a few miracles there because of their unbelief. Because of their unbelief. Is there anyone sitting here this morning who has the same resolution this year that you've had in previous years? A few of you? Yeah. A lot of times some of us gave up. There we go, Mike. We have this tendency of thinking, well, I just need a new plan. I just need to be more organized. I need to get the right material. I need to find the right gym. I need whatever it is, right? I want you to just, I I just want you to pause and consider, and I don't know if this is the answer in your life or not. I want you to just pause and consider this, though. Could it be, could it be nothing is changing because you don't really believe? I think this hit me hard this week. 
Jeff said his resolution, what he wants is more worship. That's, that's fantastic. I think for me, just to be honest with you, I, I just came to the recognition over the past couple of days, I just don't trust enough. I want to say I'm a man of huge faith and trust, but all honesty, I, I have so far to go. And if I truly want life to change, me to be different, to experience all God intends for me in life, this is what has to change. My deep belief and trust in Christ. The third thing we need to understand about belief is this. Belief is powerful. It's powerful. How powerful? Listen to what Jesus says in Mark chapter 11, verse 23. Truly, I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in their heart, but believes that what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Amen. Say, wait a minute. We get a quick amen, but for some of us, wait a minute. Am I supposed to take that seriously? Ming says yes. With confidence, I like it. It says yes with confidence. But here's my issue with the statement. Then why am I not a big league, major league ball player? It, could, I have been a, could I have been a big leaguer if I just had a little bit more faith when I was in high school? Folks, weak-armed middle infielders who struggle to hit high school off-speed pitching don't get drafted no matter how much they believe. It just doesn't happen. So what's Jesus really saying here? Well, Jesus is obviously, obviously using hyperbole. And I know this is what Ming is saying yes to. Here's the point Jesus is making. In scripture like today, mountains symbolize major difficulty. We see an example of this in Zechariah chapter 4 and verse 6 and 7. So he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to his rubble. Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. What are you, mighty mountain? Before there's a rubble, you will become level ground. Here's the point Jesus is making. He's saying, whatever mountain is standing between you and what God wills for your life, whatever mountain is standing before, between you and who God wants you to become, whatever mountain is standing between you and whatever God wants you to do, whatever mountain is standing between you and whatever God wants you to experience, God can make those mountains crumble. He can make those mountains fall. He can make those mountains disappear into the sea if you believe. If you believe. And belief or trust is best evidenced by our commitment to bring all of these things to God in prayer. Mark chapter 11, verse 24, Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer... Believe that you've received it, and it will be yours. So you want to make sure this morning that we don't walk out of here thinking that, okay, if I just believe strong enough, by the end of the year, I'm going to put on 30 pounds of muscle and be huge. Or if I just believe strong enough, I'm going to get a new job and it's going to pay me a great salary. I'm going to finally drive the car I want to drive and live where I want to live. That's not what this is about. That's not what this series is going to be about. It's not what our New New Year's resolutions, I think, should really be focused on. What I want us to see this morning is this, is that by the end of the year, we can move from where we are right now to a whole new place of being, becoming, doing what God wants us to do in our lives if we have enough faith and belief. And that's far more important, far more rewarding. And so we're going to talk more about this specifically next week, about the importance of prayer. But just to wrap it up this morning, here's what I want to ask you to do. This week, begin praying for what you really want God to do in your life. May we pray bold prayers full of thanksgiving that God will move us forward as individuals and as his church. 
And if we truly believe, not in ourselves, but in the Almighty God, we're going to see mountains fall. We're going to see God do amazing things in 2022. And this you can believe.